Hi everyone, my name is Tim Howe and I am the trombone professor at the University of Missouri School of Music. Today I will be playing the trombone etudes for the Missouri All-State Audition. At the end of each excerpt, I'm going to provide some helpful tips for your practice sessions. So the first one I want to talk about is Arbenz, page 29, number 50, which is uh, very tricky because of all these octaves. Um, and I, some suggestions for just learning this piece to begin with. The first thing you really have to do is you have to get the tune in your head. So what I like to do is I like to just play the upper line to start with, just all by itself. <laughs> So forth, and I didn't do it with the uh, with uh, alternate positions this time. But when you do it this way, try to do it with the positions that you're going to use. So it's a little trickier, but you'll get the intonation better too. You know, try the lower octave the same way. Notice that I'm not really separating anything, right? I'm just getting the thing just figure in my ear, you know. Um, practice it obviously very slowly so that you really get things to work. I would suggest that you play it both um, slurred. <laughs> So you're really finding that upper pitch really easily. If you can slur up to that, like tonguing that upper note is going to be much more accurate. The last thing is, is to try to really make sure that you're sustaining. I hope when I in the performance that you heard that I did, I tried to make sure I, I don't, I'm not going to do things like this. You know, I'm going to keep it long. Because I want my air to take me to that top note. Okay, so think about it being really almost like, not tenuto maybe, but just very, very sustained. You could also do some other things. If you're worried about the transition between there, you can try dotted rhythms. Just to sort of get used to moving quickly to that upper or bottom note. But take your time. You know, this is a good one to break up into two parts. Maybe do the first two lines one day and the last line the next day so that you're not always putting it together. Thank <laughs> you. 
So the next one is page 52 of the Arvins, number 29. And what's hard about this, obviously, is all the slurs, uh, the lip slurs. Um, and also a little bit the arpeggios that kind of follow them. So what I like to do when I practice this is I like to just, first of all, if you've not done a lot of slurring or a lot of like flexibility studies, start with that. Start putting some flexibility studies in your warm up, you know. You know, just whatever speed you can do them, but try to, you know, and try that both partials, that, that first partial that starts on B flat. And go all the way out to seventh, because if you noticed in this piece, you have to use the alternate position. So you have to know where those are. And then try the one above it. You know, start by doing that and then maybe trying to go a little bit faster because you'll have to do that in this uh, and trying to find, just getting used to that. So if you've not done much of that, that's a really good preparatory for this piece. You're not gonna be able to do it very well unless you figure that part out. Um, so the next thing I like to do with this is I just practice the triplet slurs separately and I just go from one to the next to the next to the next. So. Um, they repeat each other, you know, all these repeat like three times a piece. Notice also the alternate positions that are in the, in the book. Those are really good. So try to use as many of them as they can. They will help the slurs kind of happen naturally. You're not tonguing these notes. You're actually lip slurring them. So I will start out by doing things like this. <laughs> really just kind of going through and I'm just making sure I know exactly where I'm going on each one of those you know and that would be like my practice for the day just doing that getting those to happen the next thing I would do is I go through and I would just do those little 16th note passages that follow each of those so I would do like starting in measure four <laughs> repeat each one like three times and then go to the next one and then the next and then the next so you're just kind of following through and and just getting each of those little segments kind of organized on their own right and then begin to pull it together okay starting with just going really really slow smooth slurs all that good stuff now I realize that the first line is going to be pretty easy at that tempo but when you get to things like or you're doing all those alternate positions you might want to be slower so take a moment and just really get comfortable with that before you try to go fast right away Thank you. 
All right, so these are the three little um, parts of page 126 in the Arvind's book. Um, very much like the first one we did, I really like to practice the upper line playing the tune. So I kind of know where my upper target is all the way through. So I might start by doing things like this. <laughs> Notice that I'm playing really sustained, right? I'm not, I'm trying to think about that line horizontally as opposed to all the vertical stuff that's going to happen later, okay? Really get the tune in your head. C major is not too hard, but later on you got to do A major, so. You know, it's just a nice easy scale, right? But just trying to get that in your brain. So playing it that way. And then I play it as written um, very slowly. And I'm listening to a couple of things. I'm listening to my intonation, and I'm listening to the, the squareness of my attacks and the quality of sound all the way through. So if the and this, these are interesting because you start with low ones and you get to the high ones at the end. So the first, the low ones. <laughs> really focusing on your sound. Notice I'm not putting a lot of space in this. Even when I do it at, at, at uh, up to what I consider to be the tempo, which is not too fast, um, I'm not playing these short. I'm never going to go, right? I want it to be melodic, okay? For the high ones, this is really important that you do this, right? So when you get to the high ones, like the A major one, Really think about sustaining your sound. So again, your air is taking you up to the high A. You're not thinking about all the stuff you have to do with your embouchure. You really actually have to do very, very little. Right, notice that I'm not, I'm not like resetting my embouchure for the upper notes. I'm just tightening my corners down a little bit, blowing down a little bit into the bottom of the mouthpiece so that I get a little bit of a down, downward airstream. And then I'm making sure that I have air. Don't let it become, da, uh, right? Ta, ta. Really go to it and let it be as relaxed as possible. Um, yeah, the other thing that you can work on, especially with those high ones, in terms of like getting, finding the notes, is to play it slurred. There's some, at the bottom of the page, there's just some examples of that. Um, just re paired slurs, and then there's slurs that are all all together. So things like I'll do the other one. So all right, so that you're just really sustaining the sound, and you're getting used to making the adjustments without having to you know, take it off your face and like find the magic embouchure to play it. Because it, that really is, a, that works about 50% of the time, okay? So you're gonna get much better fundamentals out of this and much more, more better results if you think about sustaining your sound. And then you can go back and try to play things up to tempo. So this is the Arvin's page 202, number 143. So this is obviously an exercise in double tonguing. Um, if you have not double tongued before, you need to work on this separately a little bit before you begin to do this. Um, one, I understand you're going to use a T and a K syllable. So tuku or taka. Notice that it's an open vowel. It's not tiki. Okay. I some people like to use daga. I don't like it as well on something like this because it doesn't sound as clean. Um, it's also 
I'd rather start with the tuku and then if I need to keep it more slurred, I use DG. Some people like to use the DG dugu dugu syllable. So if you want to do that, you can. But start by just practicing on a scale. E flat is a great, great scale to start on and just do something like this. Tuku tuku tu. Keep it really slow. Make sure you're spitting that K out really hard and that you're keeping your air going through. The K has to have something to bounce off of. So if you keep the air going through, it works a lot better. And then just start to build speed. You know, so that it becomes like easy, you know. You may have to just practice speaking it. Tuku tuku tu, tuku tuku tu, just so you get used to it. It's almost like a little bit of a tongue twister, you know just to get used to doing that. So do that as sort of a preparatory. So like as, if when you're doing a warm up, take that, work on your double tonguing as well as, as your slurs, right? So that it becomes easy. And then this excerpt then is just a matter of working on it really uh, slow and clear. So you wanna make sure, start by just doing it. <laughs> Notice that on the eighth notes, I'm trying to get a nice, beautiful sort of square sound uh, at the beginning and end of the note. It doesn't become super short, right? And then it's a matter of going, once you've done it slowly a few times, it's pretty easy to start going fast pretty quickly. So you just part of it is you just kind of get your tongue aligned with what's going on, and it becomes pretty simple. So take your time with it. Um, spend a lot of time just doing it slowly and getting used to the double tongue. Um, and then eventually you can go pretty quick. You know, challenge yourself. See how fast, I did it a sort of a, a quick tempo for the recording just to make sure everybody could hear what's possible, but you can go as fast as you want. You know, if you want to challenge yourself. So. So that one's number 202.
next thing we're going to do is to Arbin's uh, page 231, which is the Brilliant Fantasy. Um, this is uh, like the opening intro to a series of theme and variations that Arbin wrote, Arbin wrote for uh, Trumpet, actually. Um, and a couple of things I want to say about this to begin with. Um, this is a very dramatic little piece of music. So there's no dynamics marked very much in this piece at all. There's a fortissimo in the middle, right? So he's allowing you to set the, the dynamics for this piece. And if you notice when I played this, I played some places softer and I tried to make sure I was shaping my phrases. All of that is part of the musical idea here. But what you have to do is you have to think sort of with a lot of bravado here and think very, very um, like, here it is. I want you to hear this as opposed to I'm just trying not to make a mistake, you know. So the thing that I would do with this is I would start by just working on the note part. Um, and that would be I'd take half measures and I would play, repeat each one of those half measures or even a measure uh, each time slowly at first and then um, faster in tempo. So I would do things like this. <laughs> This one works pretty well in two measured chunks, so I might do that like three times, you know, and then the next part. You know, so that I'm just getting this part figured out. The other thing I'm paying attention to is my articulation. If you look at this piece, there is very specific slurs, like that last little phrase that we I just played. It's got paired slurs. Right? So I'm really being specific about that. So when you're doing your little short repeats, pay attention and make sure you're using the articulation and slurring exactly where it's marked and not and and not where it's not marked. Okay? So the things that are separate are separate, and the things that are not are slurred. Um, be very meticulous about this. Um, so repeating all the way through, I might like I might do the first half up to the key change one day and then do the second half um, from the where the key change to the end another day. You know? Some of these, like the stuff at the end, you might have to do in pieces, you know. <laughs> So I just get smart. So like the idea is you're taking small chunks and learning them so that it's not something, this whole thing is not so overwhelming. It's just you're simplifying in small pieces and then you can gradually put that together into something bigger. Um, I want to talk about the cadenza for a minute. Um, that's, a, that's the little note stuff at the end, right? Um, start by practicing this completely in a steady tempo, just so you get everything worked out. You know, just so you get the pitches figured out, you get everything sorted out so that it's easy for you. And then you can start to do the pushing and pulling. So obviously, you can you can accelerando and and also uh, retard in the middle of this. I try to keep some of the rhythms relative. Like I try to keep the eighth notes a little slower than the sixteenths, so that there's some sense of proportion and the. The, obviously, the quarter note is slower than the eighths, but they're not necessarily metrical, right? So, but think about where the thing seems to flow for you, okay? And try it a couple of different ways. What I just did is one way you could do it, but you could do it any number of ways. You could do it that way too. So, experiment with it. Play it three or four different ways and find the one that you like. The main thing is you have to be convincing, right? 
You have to sound like you like you mean it. That really goes for this entire thing. Um, I'd also suggest, like I talked about, breaking it up into parts. Maybe doing the first three or four lines one day, the next three or four lines the next day, just kind of rotating through. So you're always, every two days or three days, you're getting through the entire thing. So you don't get that situation where you sound fantastic on the first two lines. And then because you, you've always gotten stuck somewhere in the first three or four lines and never gotten to the end, the end doesn't sound as good, right? And obviously, if you look at the end, at the four, last four lines of this are much harder than the first four lines. So they're much more likely a target for having to play um, on this piece. Now, this the other thing to think about with this is that um, obviously when you do these auditions, we don't always play the whole thing. So starting in a different place every time or starting at the end once or starting at the beginning once gets you really ready for actually having to start. All right, start on line five and play the end. You know, okay, you've already done that in your practice, so it's not a big deal. So take your time with it, work on things slowly, work it in small pieces till you feel completely um, uh, clear with your slide and your intonation. This is a great one to record yourself doing so you really hear are my dynamics coming out or not. Um, you can listen to my version and see if you like those. Um, I'm trying to make shape and phrases where it says dolce there. I play that very softly because that, that seems to be what needs to happen there. Um, so trying to find a way that works for you, um, but play with a beautiful, big, beautiful sound and great articulation. So this, the last one we're going to talk about today is uh, the Bordoni Rochu, uh, number 43. Um, this is obviously a test of your legato skills, right, and your, and your musical skills. So that's the emphasis. And my suggestion to you, first of all, is to begin by doing what we've talked about before, dividing this up. You can do like three lines, three lines, two lines, or you can do four lines, four lines. Um, what, that works best for me. Um, just, just try to take a different section every day and really work it out. Obviously, the rhythm repeats itself over and over and over again. So rhythm is not a big deal with this. So now it's about how beautiful you can make your legato. And obviously, it says piano at the beginning, and then there are no dynamics. And the idea with these to begin with, because they're vocal uses for singers, is that the singer would make phrases and would make shapes and would make musical sounds. So we have to do the same thing. But let's start with legato, okay? So let's, the way I would practice this is I would do a chunk of this just playing it on the first note or one note and just work on my legato and my rhythm. <laughs> using my dutang and my air is going through. You could even do it so you played the first note of each two measure group. You know, so you really hear it, right? Um, trying to just kind of 
work that out, all right? Notice I'm also putting shape and phrase in there. I'm making little crescendos and diminuendos. You can do that with it as well. Playing it on one note is a great way to practice your dynamics and whether your dynamics are really coming through when you do it. So I would go through my first three or four lines doing that, okay? And then I would go back through and I would do the same thing, but this time, same section, but this time I'm just going to play with no tongue at all. So I'm going to gliss all of it. And I could do that with dynamics as well, okay? The idea is I'm just really working on making my airstream never stop, okay? So the first is working on my legato tongue. The second thing is it, the glistening is to really make sure that my air is always right there. It's connecting every note to every note. It's, and then I'm just gonna, the next thing to do is we just add your tongue back to that glissando. <laughs> If you find there's a natural slur that works for you and you want to use that instead of your do tongue, go ahead. This one is so similar. I, I think I tend to tongue all of it um, just to keep it consistent. Uh, but really, again, when you add the tongue back, make sure that that airflow and that, that glissy air that you just did works and is happening. The other thing also is because it's there's a lot of um, um, slurs in, on the same partial, Make sure your slide is really moving, all right? When we play legato, our slide, we want our slide to be really fast. So we're moving in a fast, quick, relaxed way from one to the next. It's not, right? I'm not kind of half moving between. You can hear the gliss when I don't get that, right? So we don't want it to be, you know, tight robotic, but we want it to be quick. The example I like to give is if I threw a ball to you and you knew it was coming, you'd quickly reach out and grab it, right? But it wouldn't be, you knew it was coming, so you would just go get it, right? If I threw it at you and you weren't expecting it, there'd be that sort of shocking uh, reach for it, right? And that's not what we want. We want that quick, I know exactly where I'm going kind of movement um, and stopping exactly where you need to stop when you do it. Um, think about the dynamics and phrasing of this, right? Um, what things, these short two bar phrases obviously have a little sh up and down shape, right? But how do those two and two bar phrases fit together into longer units? I decided for my performance for you guys to put the first three lines in sort of one big paragraph. So all of these little short phrases kind of work together with each other. <laughs> As you can see, it's sort of, if I, each phrase kind of grows to the middle and then the last two phrases kind of bring us back down. So there's a shape there, right? Um, there's a lot of ways you could do this. You could do the first um, two lines as a paragraph and then the second, next line as a paragraph, you know? But think about the context of it. How do the phrases relate to each other? As I go down to the G flat and then back up, up into the upper register, I make a crescendo to make, you know, to heighten sort of the musical quality of it. You know, there's nearly not a wrong answer. Just be convincing and let us know, take us, let us take the, take us to the melody that you want us to hear. Okay. Record yourself to make sure that you're really getting those dynamics to come out and they're really doing what you think you're doing. And like I talked about before, play it on one note with the dynamics you eventually decide on. Mark them in so that you know what you want to do. And then play it on one note and see if really what you, the crescendo is happening and the diminuendo is happening as much as you think it is. 
Um, so again, divide this up into two or three parts and rotate through it so that you're getting through the whole thing um, all together. Now, the last thing I want to talk about um, is scales, because scales are obviously part of this, all, this uh, trial as well. So scales are, I like to talk about scales being sort of like the perfect tool. They work on so many things. If you wondered why you have to work on scales, I know they're a little bit boring, but they do so many things. They help us play in tune. They develop our register. They develop our sound in the register. They help us to get used to playing in different keys. They just, they do so many good things. I've been playing for a, a long, long time. <laughs> we'll just put it that way. And there isn't a day that goes by in my work that I don't have some kind of scale exercise because it just keeps me sharp and keeps me playing in tune. So I would encourage you to do the same. Um, try to get through all the scales that are required for you to do every two or three days, if not every day. If you can manage to get them all every day, that's great. If you want to try the minors one day and the majors the next day, but divide them up so that you get through them. Um, try to get through some version of them every two or three days so that you're, so that you're re getting used to rehearsing and getting that memory work down. If you're having trouble with two octaves, start with one octave first, you know. slow at first. I think most judges would probably say they'd much rather you play a little bit under tempo and be accurate than to try it, play it really super fast and make a lot of mistakes. You're going to get much more grace from that than you would if you just have a lot of errors because you tried to play it fast. So take your time, get it so that you can play them uh, for memory slowly and then fast, you know. But the whole idea is that you really have to, they have to become friends for you, you know, that you really understand them. Um, think about the key signature when you play. That helps me to think about what, what the key signature is and I just playing in the key signature. However that works for you. Play, practice playing with the music once and then repeat it without the music once to work on your memorization. Um, upper register stuff, uh, again, think about upper register as you send, add your air, make your air get a little bit faster aim your airstream a little bit down slightly, and then keep your corners moving downward. Not smiling, but moving downward. Uh, keep your throat open. Try to stay as relaxed as you can with your air supporting your scale. Buzz it, if you're, like for the high scales, if you're having trouble getting the notes out, see if you can get yourself to vibrate or buzz those notes. If you can buzz those notes and vibrate them, most likely you should be able to play them. If you can't get all the way to the top right away, try stages. You have plenty of time here, three or four months to kind of work this out. So like a B flat scale, I might go try to go to F first. There, I just went to G, you know? So get it so that you can, wherever your limit is, get it so you're really comfortable going to G. And then maybe a week later, go to A. And then maybe a week later, go all the way to B flat. So take your time getting, taking your time getting there, you know. Don't feel like you have to just like, you know, grit your way through it. But be intelligent about how you work it out. Um, it's a long-term goal, a long-term project. <clears throat> I know some of you are just getting started. Or all these, some of these keys are new to you, like the heavy sharp keys. You just don't play in them very much. You know, so those are the ones that you know you might have to take a little bit more time with. The last thing I want to talk about with scales is the chromatic scale. So the chromatic is very difficult for trombone because it's easy for us, to, our slide to get a little ahead or behind. <clears throat> so I like to have my students practice in small groups. So four note groups. <laughs> taking four notes at a time. I'm just making sure plus the next next the next note, right? It's four notes plus the next. 
and I'm just kind of making sure that I'm locking what I'm doing in. Okay, then I might try um, two of those four note groups together. You know, and so forth, so, until I feel really comfortable taking my time and really making sure I'm stopping in every spot. You avoid this thing where you're, you're trying to strike it on the way by. Think about stopping and really making sure you're in the right place and you're in tune. Then you can maybe try to do octaves. You know, so you really can kind of get there. You know, I don't know. I think this the one that you have to do starts with low E. All right, you can do this. You can do the same thing from low E and just do four note groups and then do eight note groups and then octaves and then um, the top of it and then you're done. So, but practice it in small pieces like that till you really feel comfortable with where you're going with your slide and make sure you're, that you're accurate and in tune. I hope you've enjoyed these tips and I enjoy, I look forward to hearing you um, <clears throat> play these things later on and uh, um, enjoy working on them because they'll really help you become a better player. Thanks everybody for checking out this video. If you have more questions about these etudes or general trombone questions, please feel free to contact me at my email address, which is linked below. If you are interested in taking an online or in-person lesson with me, you can email me to set that up as well. Keep an eye out for our Allstate Excerpts Workshop Day late in October. You can come to campus and, and we can work on these things together as well. For more information about the University of Missouri School of Music and the Trombone Studio, please check out our website at the description below. You can find our School of Music social media channels by searching the, for Mizzou Music on Instagram and Facebook and view past, past performances of the University of Missouri School of Music Trombone Choir and YouTube uh, and Brass Quintet on our YouTube channel. Good luck on your audition.